Joseph Smith claimed that he had gone out in 1820 in the woods to pray what church to join, and God and Jesus appeared to him. But in our research into the earliest documents of Mormonism, we couldn't find anyone talking about the first vision that way. There weren't diaries, there weren't newspaper articles, church literature wasn't talking about an 1820 vision of God and Jesus. So when did it start? When did Joseph start telling this story? This led to the communication with Joseph Fielding Smith, where I had submitted a question through my bishop to him to ask about some areas on the first vision and some changes that had happened in an early Mormon book that had switched from a telling of the story of the first vision from it being an angel to then being Christ, which led to the confusion of, uh, it looks like you tell it different ways, and so what really happened, and why isn't the Father mentioned in this? So Apostle Richards had said he had a diary of his great-grandpa, I think it was his great-grandpa, yeah. Or be great, 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 whatever, it, yeah. <laughs> whichever great it was. Uh, that he had, that this uh, great grandfather had uh, talked with Joseph Smith and gone right home and written in his journal about his talk with Joseph and said that he told, Joseph told him about the father and the son appearing to him. And I thought that doesn't sound right because all the historical things we'd seen so far. Time-wise, that t way of telling the First Vision story, I didn't see in Mormon literature until a later date. So we asked if we could see the actual diary entry to verify it, because uh, uh, when we went up to see him, he just showed us a typescript. Mm -hmm. And then we were asking him, well, uh, we wanted to see the original, not just the typescript, because uh, it's the, the quote sounded like Joseph Smith was dead, like it was a retrospective recounting of an event, not someone writing in their diary that night. And uh, Richard Scott real miffed with us, and there's a, <laughs> more to the story that's in the book. But he finally took us over to the Mormon's genealogical library that had the microfilm of the diary which led to um, confrontation between him and Gerald because uh, when, he, when Richards got to the film and the part where that quote was, he wouldn't let Gerald turn the page back to look at earlier frames on the microfilm to see what the date was on the diary because the page itself was in the past tense. And so it can't be this immediate recording. So what, when did this guy write this down? And uh, then we got denied to be able to see it. Eventually we were able to see it. And uh, just like we suspected, it was his memoirs in 1887, I think it was. And so it was no value historically for proving an event that was supposed to happen in the 1840s in Nauvoo, Illinois. I think if I remember correctly in the book, you say, that uh, for you guys, that was really notable because it showed that uh, the LDS Church wasn't just misled. They had things to hide. Right. And they were actively hiding things that were damaging to the reputation of the church. Um, now, in recent days, there's been so much more that's come out. Uh, lots of these documents have been released. They have the gospel topics essays out now. Do you think that that is still um, true of the higher... Uh, higher ups in the LDS Church currently, do you think that they're still withholding information that's damaging, or do you think, for the most part, uh, they're they're being honest and upfront about a lot of those things now? Well, they're being more upfront and they're being more open, and they have done a great service by doing their Joseph Smith Papers project, where they put all kinds of journals and letters and documents and things up for public view on the internet, and that's commendable. But it isn't all there and they still are withholding certain diaries of early church leaders. There are certain topics they still are very protective of. So they've come a long way, but they have not reached openness. They are more open, but there are things they are still withholding, like the full Clayton diary. 
that was an issue for us that we wanted access to. Uh, in fact, we got sued over the fact that we printed some parts of the Clayton Diary. Um, and the importance of that diary was, for us, was some entries on polygamy. Um, but the whole, that whole time period is not open. Mm. They have a ways to go yet for full disclosure. Sure. Yeah, I mean, they, everything still kind of spun and half explained and, and uh, so even though the documents are there, you get uh, some kind of a faith promoting twist on it or you have to dig deep in the, in the footnotes to find the information. Uh, but that's still much, much better than not having the document at all. I mean, when was it? The, the Egyptian grammar and alphabet, which is part, basis of part of the Book of Abraham, clear images only became uh, available within the last 10 years. Yeah. And uh, before that, everyone had to use this very poor reprint of the Tanners. And, uh, and so you could have BYU's John Gee, who was the Egyptologist down there, claiming things about these images that weren't true, but there was no way for you to uh, evaluate it. So, um, yeah, uh, I would say that they need to come more clean, but it's strange how, like, for example, first they're not admitting that there was a stone in the hat, and they almost go immediately to celebrating. Oh, isn't this wonderful? So Sandra has a relative who works down the history department. He wrote this book on the stone in the hat. At once they, uh, once they put it forward, and it's just this glowing thing, and shows these wonderful pictures of Joseph with the light coming out of the hat. And that, you know, I mean, it's, it's PR, it's packaging, and uh, I don't expect that to ever go away. Thank you.